Welcome to Let's Talk Geek, episode 133, recorded on 10 July 2013. In the show, we're talking about Android, Jelly Bean, Overtakes, Gingerbread, and Security Hole, so fragments and holes, as it were. The future of GPS and Russia loses three GLONASS satellites in a proton crash. We talk about Telcom and their copper plans. Thanks for joining us. In the show with me today, we have... Luke. Hello. Hello, Luke. Johan. Hello, Johan. Hello, hello. And <laughs> me, Jan Vermeulen. The show is being mixed by Annie Vermeulen, who is not mic'd up or videoed up today because she's not feeling too good. <laughs> but she'll wave at you. Thanks for mixing for us tonight, Annie. Um, you can catch us if you're watching this live right now irc.ltnet.tv join us there if you're not uh, watching this live right now join us live next time we record on Wednesday evenings uh, we try to start as close to 8 o'clock as possible with the stream up at around 7.30 um, so yeah join us then we always start the show with a bit of a random and today has something to do with what happens on the 10th of July and not the show number because it's too awesome to pass up. And it's Nikola Tesla's birthday today, the 10th of July. Nikola Tesla was awesome. And one of the uh, <laughs> one of the invent, well, I, I would probably argue the inventor of AC, AC electricity. electricity. Yeah. Um, so he teamed up with Westinghouse to make that uh, as a transmission technology possible. And his arch rival, Thomas Alva Edison, was a noob. That fiend! <laughs> yeah, it seems to be the, the, the geek um, zeitgeist at the moment that, that uh, you know, Edison was a noob and, uh, and just a businessman and Tesla was the true nerd. Anyway. <laughs> I'm, Can't I'm, go wrong. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Tesla. You can <laughs> stick around. Could have st stuck around. Anyway, yeah. We're going to do a bit of a quick geek the way this works is we ramble through a bunch of topics. The mixer keeps us in line, which is going to be difficult without her voice, but she's going to try. No more than two minutes per topic. He who is most interesting wins. We I start was, with... I was looking at the fact that she does have chicken to throw at us. <laughs> <coughs> so I suggest staying there two minutes. Yeah, all right. Let's okay. stay under two minutes. So Don't want chicken stains either. So <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Keep our clothes <laughs> clean. First up, Jelly Bean officially overtakes Gingerbread as the most used Android OS version, coming in at just under 38% Finally. of all Android devices. Finally. <laughs> and we could start targeting the, the newer APIs and be so much better. Ah, cool. Um, so has this been an issue for, for guys like you who have to, had to develop um, Android? I I had to make a decision earlier this year where I d deliberately am only targeting 4.0 devices and up because of, you know, USB type interfaces and so on. So um, I had to make that choice and I decided even back then, okay, screw it. Unfortunately, I have to do this. And so, you know, like two thirds of the user base can't use the app, but so be it. Yeah. Um, and it's sad to do that, but it had to be done. Otherwise, we can't do what we need to do with those devices. So, mm -hmm. um, Toby Korean, who we've had on Let's Talk Geek before and is n uh, now on Let's Talk Hack once a month, uh, also active at House for Hack, who kindly hosts us, um, he um, wa recently chatted to a journalist – a technology journalist in the SA tech journal space, turned it into an article on HTEXT. Um, if you haven't uh, heard about them, htext.co.za. And um, very interesting, he actually argues that the whole, the whole argument around Android's fragmentation is in fact moot. Um, I can agree with that because a lot of what you can do in Android is that you can, you can backport uh, using the specific APIs, so it features that are only available in later versions of Android. Uh, it's just the limitation is hardware. Um, if you need to use the hardware in some kind of funky form, you can't do that. Uh -huh. uh, so... Uh, alas, but <laughs> so be it, you know? Yeah, and, and hence why you had to make yes. your design yeah. decision. All right, interesting. So then um, we are being threatened with chicken. We shall move swiftly along. Security hole in Android. Luke, you picked up on this. Oh, security hole in Android. 99% um, of devices, and apparently you and I with our Galaxy Nexi, which are Google devices, yes. are vulnerable. Um, what's up with that? So there's a security hole, which we're, um, <laughs> um, whereby people can hack into the 
securely signed APK and alter the content and make it still look like it's signed by you. Um, um, is that, would that be like in system apps? So they could yes. effectively hack the Gmail so APK? Because the, the, the Google um, security keys are known, you can hack into those applications that effectively run your, your phone. Uh, and so people said, oh, well, this is only proof of concept. But people have already started making proof of concept applications. So who knows how long it'll take before those apps become available and start being used and so no, forth. they'll be in the first store already. Yeah. And, yeah. and more than that, I mean, what, but, what's um, interesting in the, in the security space is every single time we hear about a zero-day exploit that's gone on patched for years, um, there's uh, suddenly reports crop up of, you know, uh, intelligence agencies and other oh, sure. nefarious people using uh, these zero-day exploits for yonks already before it was discovered by somebody who's willing to blow the whistle on it. But, I mean, if you're a casual user anyway, it, it doesn't affect you much unless you're like side loading or getting from unknown, um, you know, non-play store locations. Then you're, you're still fine. But I mean, if if you if you're side loading, you should definitely check out the location or the details about that APK that you're downloading because you just never know. Mm -hmm. I mean, better be well, safe that, than sorry. Uh, but that's a good uh, policy to have in the first anyway, place. Anyway, yes. yes. So, so even, even if we didn't know about the zero day, installing applications from untrusted sources is just a bad. So that's the only, so this isn't, this isn't as bad as, you know, like red and red uh, alarm raising as, oh, the, it's the end of Android security, trust uh, and, and, and reliability and trustworthiness and all that stuff. This is just if you're side loading. So the guys that found this expert Exploit, Blue Box. Uh, they made an app that you can then download, uh, which kind of looks like this. And those little red markers are showing me that my phone uh, is attackable. And the second option down here is showing you that, uh, well, I, I'm a developer, so I had to turn on the uh, feature where it won't check the source of the, uh, the APK. So it's telling me my phone is insecure because I'm allowed non-play sources. Uh, so that that that's kind of cool, actually. That this you you have an app that can quickly search through the apps on your phone to see if those uh, apps are effectively exploiting this exploit. Oh, so interesting. So if you're can highly I, scared about I, it, you can, can, I ask can you a question. check it out. Um, before this announcement, have you ever heard about Blue Security? Blue Box Security. No, but I would also be dubious about that. Uh, because if I go through what the, is the comments, history? yes. <laughs> if I go through the comments in the story, we've got somebody who goes. Patched in February by Google. This was I've patched also in February seen by that. Google. But, but, but my point is that if it was patched in February, then why haven't they rolled it out yet? Um, and also, and it's probably because but, it's, it's mitigated by the fact that people who ha don't have unknown sources checked right. are not vulnerable. So it's not that critical a bug. But I would also think about what about the older phones as well, where OEMs are not likely to uh, update you know the the firmware yeah. so like if you had a like my old phone the the milestone uh it's not getting an update ever uh yes. so yeah. Aren't you now stuck? Isn't it a problem? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Comment from IRC from Akuri. Um, the Cyanogen mod guys have patched their ROMs already. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, well done. All right. So some fun in games. This was hilarious. Ars Technica reporting. And this is just to illustrate that uh, I think the world is full of, uh, of incompetent government departments. We're not alone in that here in South Africa. The U.S. Economic Development Agency, which falls under the Department of Commerce, if memory serves, um, shut down its servers and enterprise mail exchanges, cuts the agency off from the internet, and then spends over a million dollars on, on temporary alternative infrastructure rented from the Census Bureau, and then spends over $800,000 on security contractor to investigate and remove the malware that they found to, to, to have been infected with. And the CIO, not satisfied... <laughs> with the outcome of the investigation and the cleaning of the malware from the systems, orders all their equipment destroyed, down to what? mice. They destroyed Everything. all their hardware, including Everything. mice, keyboard, screens. mice, printers, and cameras. But it gets better. <laughs> okay, sorry. They ran out of... It cost... So this is a, they, they, they destroyed $170,000 worth of IT equipment. Then it had to stop because they ran out of money <laughs> <laughs> for destroying equipment. So, thankfully, $3 million worth of equipment was spared <laughs> because they ran out of money to keep destroying it. 
That was oh, funny. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So a slightly older story, but something we haven't covered uh, at all. You're right. Uh, Luke, I, I, is a this came out of the blue scanner for me from because no one seems to have mentioned it. And the only place that seemed to cover it was um, Engineering News. Yeah. Right. And uh, they featured an article about a month ago about how we have come up with one of the world's most sophisticated X-ray machines. And so it has a history in uh, – it's by De Beers, of course, and they wanted to protect you know, their diamond rights and whatnot and people stealing diamonds from the mines. And so they came up with a whole bunch of scanners where uh, you know, they, could, they could image people going, leaving for the day to see if they didn't have diamonds. But the technology became really flicking sophisticated. Um, okay. So, I mean, uh, as this article says, you can do a full body scan with multiple scans in less than 13 seconds. And uh, what's also impressive about it is that they say that the device emits a radiation dose of 0.12 milligrays, which is 10 times less that of a conventional X-ray. And more, more importantly than that is it does it once. It's one scan. Yeah. Uh, so you don't have to have multiple X-rays each and every time, you know, from multiple Angles, um, angles yeah, and whatnot. You dose more than once. So what's interesting about this is it's safe enough for other people to be around you and get uh, dosed. Uh, yeah, that guy's not wearing like a leather apron or anything, no, it looks like. Or he's just standing there. Shield. And that's brilliant. Wow. And how has no one covered this? <laughs> um, well, yeah. in, Engineering News did. So uh, you mean, you mean why, yeah. isn't, like, why don't we know about it more? Why isn't this a new I scientist, for goodness sake? <laughs> If, if it's so, you know, if it's so brilliant, then why haven't we heard about it before? Yeah. And then, and then, more interestingly, is like right here at the bottom of the article, they say no, it was featured in Grey's Anatomy on uh, an episode in season nine, and that was like back in March. And how is it that the Yanks, whoa, whoa. the Yanks, know about it, but we don't? <laughs> how do you uh, know when Grey's Anatomy? Season because I actually looked up that episode. Oh, okay. just, just <laughs> I'm like, when was this episode? Okay, it's apparently episode eighteen of season, season nine. nine. So. Cool. Uh, that's pretty Great. cool. His name is the Exemplar DR. Sorry, I didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool bananas. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, uh, you can at least say they, they reckon they, they're producing around 24 scanners a year. So the things are rolling up. Oh, so, they even have it at Chris Harney as well. So, I mean, the fact that they have their prototypes or not even prototypes, I guess, their like, active yeah. machines are out mm. there and they've been developed for many years already. Yeah, it, it's actually it's, interesting. It's, and it, and it's, uh, it does – and perhaps this is a discussion we can have another time. But it yeah. speaks to what um, a technology audience finds interesting because yes. that's what a media organization would tend to cover. So, basically, what, what that says is that, uh, that most people don't believe that an audience would find a really cool X-ray machine de developed in South Africa and being rolled out globally, featured in Grey's Anatomy, that interesting. <laughs> interesting enough to click on and interesting enough for a journalist to spend their time on. Uh, but, <laughs> I digress. But, but we'll we're the kind that. of the target audience for like technology, so I guess we would want to see this kind <laughs> yeah, of stuff. Exactly. So, but it's, it's cool to see that it, it, it hit engineering news eventually after being featured on Grey's Anatomy. Sure. Yeah, some months ago. Yeah. Um, then, uh, courtesy of our mixer, though I'm going to providing, be providing the voice, um, is a space topic. A Russian Proton M rocket carrying three GLONASS navigation satellites crashed soon after takeoff from Kazakhstan's Baikonur Cosmodome. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Early evidence suggests engine failure was responsible, but insiders say they believe it was a human error that caused the rocket to veer wildly out of control almost immediately after launch. Okay, so it has been confirmed oh, since wow. the writing of this report. This just in. GLONASS is the Russian equivalent of the US's Jeep GPS system. Um, also, interestingly, I don't think we've covered this in Let's Talk Geek before. Oh, the, the Indians, Indians have just yes, launched their, yes. their first uh, satellite. They want to be in on this. Well, no, they just want regional coverage. They just want for India. Yeah. And I find that completely and utterly industry, uh, uh, interesting, considering the industry is I'm from. It's actually falling apart in, in, in the sky. Oh, really? yeah. Oh, Crazy. yeah, there we go. That's a lot of money. That these spacefaring nations are all getting their own, I, I find amazing because they, they just don't want U.S. to be in control yeah, of that and, and positioning stuff. After Edward Snowden's leaks, I think more people are going to be keen on launching their own type of positioning systems. Um, and also, aren't we supposed to be getting a whole, like a completely – Galileo is still coming. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think Galileo still sits at like four satellites that have actually been launched. So it's still years away from actually being useful. But I think they have enough to do tests with. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. So more on this was almost immediately after takeoff, the rocket swerved to one side, tried to correct itself, but instead veered in the opposite direction. It then flew horizontally and started to come apart with its engines in full thrust. It hit the ground Oopsie. just over 30 seconds after launch in a giant fireball. The crashed Proton M rocket employed a DM-03 booster, which was being used for the first time since December 2010, when another Proton M rocket with the same booster failed to deliver yet another three GLONASS satellites into orbit, Reads crashing into the, the Pacific. In the RC. From and the mixer. And the mixer, a young technician installed a guidance sensor upside down. <laughs> I mean, how can we laugh at that? I mean, it's the same as like, the, you know, the distance measures where the guy calculated for feet and it was in meters and yeah, those kinds and of things. So, exactly. The guy yeah. programmed in feet. Feet per yeah, second feet per or, second. Or yeah. So it's it's just the same. You know, you can oh, give brilliant. them their their one times mistake. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is now the second time a proton M booster didn't make things, it up. I mean, it's Gar expensive though. Garo, I mean, how do you install it upside down? They normally got prawns on one side, so you probably forced it in. <laughs> being being you know being trained as an electronics engineer, you find a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly. Yeah. Right. yeah, exactly. So the mixers just uh, said that if you look at it, the, the sensor has an arrow on it and everything. Oh, side dear, that up. makes it worse. <laughs> okay, right. take it back. Yeah, it, it happens. It happens. <laughs> like Only you, once. <laughs> you'll make this mistake once in your life. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you're, you'll probably have to sit down to a committee and it'll be like, how? <laughs> what did you do this Put for? Tell the guy, show us. <laughs> Why did you just... Case, yeah, well, but take some solace in the fact that you made this mistake <laughs> once. Um, then sticking with the location services, Garmin's heads-up display connects smartphone navigation to any windscreen. This is a pretty cool look. I want this. Mostly because I, I'm, I'm one of those that when I go places, I constantly look at the phone and then I miss my destination. So uh, anything that helps me by projecting the image onto like my, my, my wind, windscreen it's a okay with me, yeah. and that's what Garmin's done here. So they call it HUD, uh, Garmin HUD, and um, yeah. yeah, for heads-up display, and it, they apparently can connect it to any smartphone via Bluetooth, and so it's compatible with pretty much most of the major navigation apps on all of the platforms. So your your maps and your Apple Maps Very even cool, and it's cool to see Garmin moving in this direction because yes. the, the PND, the personal navigation device space. Um, is getting increasingly encroached upon by the likes of Google Maps and Apple Maps and all these well, guys. even the Glass, ship, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. who ship navigation apps right on their smartphones, right? Yeah. So, so why do you need a PND if you've right. got it in your smartphone? So, I mean, if it's a you know, cheap device, it says they're $130, which, eh, But You can get you know, a, G, a whole GPS. Sure, enough, it's, it's not a whole – It's I don't need to get specialist a specialist car or a specialist equipment to do this. I can just get this little – Bluetooth thingy and off I go. Yeah, you know? that's pretty cool. That's pretty so, cool. I'll, I'll buy one. The second they land in South Africa, I want one. Yeah, I want one. I really want one. That's really cool. <laughs> All right, then uh, Boxy team joins Samsung. That's Boxy as in the little device maker, not the YouTube celebrity. That's the thing. You're wrong. They weren't a device maker. Boxy was an open source project. Yes. Different, derived from XBMC, yes. Xbox Media Center. And there was also an application you could run and it sorted out playing media from a media server. Apparently, a, a while back, they actually went, oh, they'd linked in up with D-Link, and they brought out the first boxy box. Yes. So the first media center type device that you could buy on the market, put next to a TV and play your media. And I got this email because I was, I played around with boxy many years ago, and I got this email on Saturday to say, oh, no, they've been acquired by Samsung. Now, I've been playing around with that thinking that this could be very interesting because if you look at the Samsung stable of products, they don't have a media server. But they've got a lot of viewing devices. I mean, from notebooks to cell phones to but, televisions. But don't Samsung smart TVs already have a boxy app? They I mean, have it's just an open source project, right? Well, so. they have. I know they have a Plex app, mm. and we'll get to that a little bit later in the show. But I'm not sure about boxy. But I mean, all of them, all of these media servers have got a UPnP service of some sort. But boxy also gave you a good user interface, so it was something you could run on top of your Linux or Windows machine, and it took care of. A interface up, down, left, right, find your media, little back of back end that it could search and trawl IMDb and populate and all that sort of stuff. But I mean, I've been reading into this deeper going, okay, so what's going to come from Samsung? Think about it. I mean, it you makes got, sense. You've got if your phone, you've got your tablet, you've got your notebook, you've got your fridge with a display on it. Yeah. 
And they don't have a media server in the house. So mm. this could well, be trying, a major... They're trying to turn... They're trying to make it so that all the devices can kind of talk to one another. So They've especially from the smartphone. Yes. Uh, from, from, from the things with like real powerful hardware in them. Yep. So the smartphones and tablets, you can throw the image up onto basically any other Samsung device with yes. a display using that all share thing of theirs. Yes. So they've got that already. So... But but it's still a sharing between a device and a, and a TV. It's not really going through a media server. Mm. So think about walking into your house and having your fi- pictures sync on your local network into your box or your Samsung media server. And with, with That's a decent nice. interface. That yeah, yeah. Samsung software hasn't been the, of the highest quality when it comes to the UI side of things. So yes. it, it could be good to have some decent UI guys so it's on gonna, the team. I, All right. I, I'm excited. I'm going to see. I mean, they changed their homepage. I just... Uh, did post it and actually if you now go into the boxy service itself uh, they only offer the serv- the server the boxy server from the from d-link so you can't it doesn't look like you can download the software anymore so i'd love to see where this goes it could actually be interesting mm, mm. another thing you you saw johan is the kindle buffet yeah this is something my wife's been tiddling around forever so if you go to weberbooks.com dot uh, weberbooks.com forward slash kindle um Amazon Kindle's webpage does offer a, a, a listing of whatever's on special today, including the zero, rate, zero dollar. But apparently, I haven't done this. Uh, you, you've got to sit on the side all day and see how this, as the books come in the top and scroll. Oh down. my! Yeah, exactly. Uh, who's exactly. got time for that? <laughs> so my wife, an RSS actually, feed. <laughs> yeah. My wife actually found this, and she's been telling about it. And I was a bit bored on one of my trips, and I actually visited, and I actually found a couple of very good. Um, Business books, that's also listed. So what they do is on a daily basis, they get a writer to actually trawl through those books from, from Amazon that's free today and actually only list the highlights. Okay. Okay. Now, they, they, they vary. They're from romances to cowboy to whatever. But if you actually just go there every day and just trawl, it doesn't take long. works on a mobile. It's not really mobile. It's optimized. a very basic site. It's very basic. So it's very easy to go through and you'll actually find a lot of other books. Um, I've, I've found a couple of cooking books that look very nice. There's some, um, like I said, business books, self, not self-motivation not self type of books. So just out there, have a look. And the way the site's been built, if you like a book, you click on it. It takes you straight to the the, uh, Google, uh. the Amazon page. And if you've got your one-click buying activated, you can just click the one big and then you get the book. Yeah. All right. So, And if you don't have a Kindle, it doesn't matter. The Kindle app is available for all platforms, including the browser. So even if you are thinking about getting a Kindle, get Get, build up your library. It's free. I mean, the book. There's one of them. There's one of them that's actually uh, listed for thirty five dollars, and it's free for now. So, go for it. Yeah. See, they also seem to be doing apps. So, uh, yeah, I just there is a bit of a pop ups that come through on this page. So, oh, they do the Android app of the day as well. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's cool. There um, you go. So yeah, Amazon Amazon app of the day was the was the next thing you had oh, listed. Yes. Right? Just in case anybody <laughs> missed it, uh, the Americans has been shouting about this forever. Amazon, if you've got the Amazon app store installed on your phone, it is needed to be side loaded. So take note um, on your Android phone. The, the Americans have been crying that every day Amazon gives away a free app. Yes, the last week it's only been a game, but every now and then there is a nice app that comes through. So. Just take note that now works in South Africa. You just uh, need an, a working Amazon account. Yes, I think we covered this in a in a previous Let's Talk Geek episode when they first announced it. But oh, it's okay. a it's a yep. good it's a good reminder. And if you want free apps and you have an Android device, you're new to Android, perhaps um, you can get free apps through Amazon. You just need an Amazon okay. account. You have to turn on one click buy, so that's one way they get you. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. So <laughs> yes. Oh, same with um, same with Kindle Buffet and and Amazon app because our time zone is different. Read carefully. So before you hit the one-click buy, I've done it with one book where it actually expired already. Okay, the book luckily only cost me $2, but just, just read carefully that, that it's yeah. still on special. Yeah, yeah. That right. brings us to the end of the Quick Geek, and I'm going to take us How do we do? straight into events. 24 minutes, not too bad. All right, so it was a relatively quick Quick Geek. Good job, Mixer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so what uh, <laughs> <laughs> fails to compute? <laughs> Yay, I win. Um, so uh, some events coming up. If uh, we haven't listed, we're not going to go through everything, but you can check out stardates.co.za 
And uh, we, I mean, stuff that we've spoken about before is we've got Rage coming up. We've got the My Broadband co- Conference coming up. We've got My Gaming running Dota competitions every Sunday. Um, so all that's happening. We're not going to talk about it in, in much depth right now. But, Johan, um, you uh, or Annie actually saw this and, and thought that this is something you could talk about. Is the yes. MediaTek Expo coming to the Coca-Cola Dome? Okay, being in broadcasting, um, MediaTek is a two-year event at the Coca-Cola Dome. This is the South African, call it broadcasting, television, production, staging show of the year. Um, if you've never attended it, this is a good day out. Um, the, the guys bring out the big guns. Even if you don't want to go into the dome, even the outdoor staging area is always a, a winner where they, they invite four, menu, uh, f- so four suppliers to build stage, audio stages. So we're a band with Very play nice. facing each other. In a square. <laughs> okay. And trust me, when the big buyer steps onto that square and goes, who am I going to use? These guys are not scared about the fact that they rattle the windows in the dome center. <laughs> oh, in the Northgate center. Very right. nice. So it happens once over that weekend. If you're there, you're lucky. Um, sorry, it's not a weekend. Um, it's actually Wednesday to Friday. But it happens somewhere in those three days that you will have a good decibel down at the run of a stage. So that's very nice. But then inside of the dome, oh, you've got all the major players. Sony right. will be there. Panasonic will be there. Or through other, other themselves with the agencies, you'll see cameras that you'll never see in the shops. Um, go find the Sony Phantom Gold 2. Um, the high speed and just cry about stuff that you can't have. You can never have. <laughs> just, just don't look at the price tag, and that's the key. <laughs> no, there's no price on it. Oh, okay. No, okay. But, no, but so there's wow. a reason. Like SQ wow. Thing on yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. um, but there's a reason why it's called the gold. It's because the whole seat sink is painted gold. But this is a high speed camera they actually use for a lot of the television ads. All right. Runs at 50,000 frames a second, something ridiculous. So that's sort of a technology. And then you'll see that lower end sound systems, ugh, call it. Everybody is there if you want to go and actually have a look. Mm-hmm. This next segment of the show, show, show <clears throat> even, is uh, something I like to call, What Geekery Is This? And we're going to start with the Plex Media server. <laughs> now, Johan has been trying to convince us all to switch our media servers at home to Plex. At least 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but, but, but run us through it, Johan. What, okay. what is Plex? Plex is, I want to say it's not open source, okay? There's no source code for it. However, the Plex media server is free, okay? So this is an application you can download, Windows, Mac, or Linux, or NAS storage. They actually support a couple of oh, NAS boxes. That's interesting. Yeah, pre-compiled, Okay. So you download the application, you install it on your machine, then you point it to your totally legal media library. Now, <laughs> you use the same filing rules as all the other ones, where you've got your movies in their own folders, and you've got your series and then season. So when you actually install this application, it tells you, okay, here's your media service installed, and here's a web page. Then you open this Plex server up in a web page, and it just becomes ridiculous. You actually then go and set up your library. So you set your movie library, your shows library, your photo library, your music library, or your private libraries. It then trawls on its own through that foot structure, go finds all the metadata, clip um, um, album art and everything, and just populates everything into a browser. You can then, through the browser, go through the whole system and find what you want and view Track what, what you've watched by little buttons. It shows you I've watched. A full orange circle shows you have not watched it. A half circle shows you you have started watching it. And a white circle shows you, haven't, uh, you, ha- you have watched it already. It takes you through that whole system. And then it does at the, at the moment present a flash player, which you then view in. It can go full screen and all of that. But where this thing really plays over the rest is the fact that I've got a built-in real-time restreamer or re, re, um, re-encoder. So you, from your device point of view, can set the bit rate that you want. And you can say you want one meg a second over your Wi-Fi or you can want 10 meg over your network or even down to 96 kilobits. Oh, so it's not just transcoding, it's compressing. Well, it's, it's, it's transcoding into a lower bit rate. Yeah. So on the fly. P- yeah, on the PS3 fly. media server transcodes into something that... A uh, Windows Media Player enabled uh, only enabled device can understand, but it doesn't recompress. So okay, this, so is this thing does recompress. Well, call it then re- it recompresses back into the bitrate you set on your device, and that's done on the fly. So you can literally be now uh, if you picked it up, where they're making their money is they're actually charging them for the client app. So you can do all of what I've said now free in the web browser, but now you would like to use it on your Android phone. 
that's where they charge. So they charge you five dollars for the Android application. Okay. I haven't even so uh, paid it. Can I can I ask yeah, questions go, on the IRC already? Can it handle multiple hard disk drives inserted separately via dock? It runs. If you're going to do that, you're going to you're going to install it on Linux, and it's an application you load on Linux. Okay. The MediaPlex server is loaded as a application. Okay. So yes, as long as Linux supports the multiple hard drive inserted separately over docks, then it's fine. Okay. It. If you want to go that technical, install the Plex server for Linux because then you can do NFS mounts, to NAS boxes, you can do X, XFS extensions. So whatever. you're going to need a Linux server of some kind to run your NAS. No, no, no. Well, you're going to run the Plex server on some sort on of. On something, box. sorry, to, yeah. to talk to your NAS. Okay. But it's also available for Mac. So you could theoretically install it on your Mac, point it to your network, your network NAS, and have just your Mac do the re encoding and the presenting onto the network. You've made me now wonder if it can run on a Raspberry Pi. They actually said it will run on a Raspberry Pi. It just won't recompress. The <laughs> CPU won't keep up. Okay. All right. Now, my little box sitting at home, I've got it installed on a, uh, a VR 1, gig, one gigahertz with 2 gigs of RAM. And that thing is happily restreaming one, one stream. It will support multiple streams when your CPU can keep up. Okay. All right. So... And then, like I, oh, what I was saying is, okay, so you pay for the app on your Android, and it, it now becomes a different product. If you're watching the stream, you can see it, where it's a full user interface where you can now very easily – it's not a connection to a, to, a, to a web server. This is a proper application that runs and takes you through your whole library, same thing. And in the mobile version, you can set Wi-Fi or 3G speeds as separates. And this thing will, re, on the fly, recompress down to 96 kilobits per second. So if you've got that nice ATA uncapped, you could theoretically watch your stuff anywhere in the world from your server at home. ATA doesn't have an uncapped 3G option. To tell, oh, sorry. To, no one does, as far as I know. Ah, okay. um, not, not, that's, not that doesn't get completely throttled to the point that it's good, that'll unusable. be unusable, okay. like MTN. All right. yeah. or, or, or you <laughs> sit in the... E e but you get really high caps from guys like... There's only uh, one way to find out. Number. You've got to use it. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. Okay, so really, this thing is just, it's, it's so simple to use. It's so good. They then, they step up. So then you, they offer you a MyPlex subscription. Now, what that adds to the whole thing is now you can suddenly use your Android app. It's a, it's a yearly subscription. It's not a lot. I think it's 700 Rand for the year. But then they add the additional services that you can use the Android app, find the show you want, click a button, a little paper clip, and make it available offline. Ah, now okay. it will That's restream nice. off into your phone and be available offline. So now when you are planning to travel, you know it's there and it's been re-encoded re so it works on your phone. Jeez, they're just like one step away from having a, their own sort of Netflix type service where you could This is, the, the, you, you read the forums, this is what they're saying. It's Netflix from home. Yeah. It's exactly what it is. And when you've got, the, when you've got um, that, okay, that's the one. But then even if you just register on their website where you then publish your server into, yep. it's more they just take care of dynamic DNS type of scenarios so that you can find your server on the internet. But when your server is published in there, I can take some of my library, so where I created movies, and I can share it with you. Okay. And your Plex client will actually come up and show Luke's library. Now that becomes... <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's very meta. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Yeah, have some in my library for a it while. It costs nothing. <laughs> like I said, up to the browser point, it's going to cost you ten minutes of your time. Yeah. Like okay. A, no, sorry. Uh, broadband in South Africa, it's going to cost you twenty minutes of your time. <laughs> you download, yeah, to download, but yeah. But, but, let's talk about broadband in South Africa. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Nice segue into the next. Yeah. Section. So, so actually, interesting. Um, some news uh, we got to break last week is um, Telcom's plans to reduce. The their wholesale ADSL pricing, uh, otherwise known as IP Connect or IPC. But then uh, they push the line rentals up. Uh, well, they've already pushed the line rentals up, um, I, but uh, the wholesale rates are coming down. Um, but we've been warned um, by sources in industry that, in fact, the rate cut is not going to be as significant as last time. So for those of you with uh, relatively long memories, um, there was uh, what looked like a deal brokered between ICASA and Telcom during the last uh, local loop unbundling talks. Mm. And Telcom ended up cutting their wholesale IPC rates 
well, whole, that's a tautology, but the IPC rates by 30%. Okay. And um, that caused the spate of ADSL pricing reductions um, with some notable exclusions. So MWeb took some pain because they did not reduce their pricing on their top end product, their 4 megabit per second and their 10 megabit per second uncapped product. And so um, now potential reasons for that have started to become clearer. The the we've been we've been told that some ISPs might actually cut their rates before rate cuts come through. They might cut their prices before rate cuts come through, attract an audience, and then know that the rate cut is coming and then need to make their money back when the how much the rate cut will no. be. Oh, so it's, that's it's, a gamble. It's sort of like gambling, but it's gambling based on information that you know. So you must okay. trust your sources in industry oh, wow. is what it sounds like, right? <laughs> so um, so that then could be an indication of why MWeb did not cut their rates on at least their top-end product because the, it was already – and, and the exact words of the uh, MWeb ISP CEO when we interviewed him about this on Let's Talk Geek was it was – already very, very competitive. And so many people in industry came out saying that it's unsustainable, and perhaps it was, is what I'm, is what I'm wondering at out loud. At the time, perhaps it, at, sure. Yes, perhaps at the time it was unsustainable, but they bargained on the wholesale prices coming down enough for it to become sustainable and getting the volumes necessary and then, you know, then make their money back when the, when the wholesale pricing comes down. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, well... I mean, unfortunately, I wasn't here that night, but I've been an MWeb uncapped subscriber since 2010, May 2010, and mm-hmm. I've been paying the same rate every month for my uncapped service. So am I expecting a discount if everything around it is going up? Got to be fair. But you feel that that's the essence of competition. If everyone else is lowering their cost, then why yeah, like, is Nimwe? Like Web you Africa's know? uncapped ADSL pricing is incredibly competitive now. I think yeah. they're under 400 rand a month for an uncapped 4 meg connection now, where um, Mweb is still here between the 400 500 rand mark. 539. Um, oh, sorry, above yeah. 500 rand. You're right. Yeah. Um, I'm, th- I'm thinking of if you include the line, it comes down yeah. to below 500, um, effectively. So yeah, uh, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing to ponder upon. I think. Yes. Um, and I guess what I'm saying is, uh, based on the information we have on hand right now, do not bank on saving any money from this next round of rate cuts necessarily. If there's a well, bigger straight cut, away. Yeah. yeah. If there's a bigger cut, then maybe the ISPs will go cool. We can uh, get our margins back to normal and we can pass on a bit of a saving to our customers. That's what I'm hoping for. At least I'm sure that's what they're hoping the, for because the fact is... It's the we, best we can hope yeah, for. <laughs> the fact is what, what's bad for them is um, we, my broadband, end up reporting on the fact that there's a wholesale price cut Oops. and then people are going, oh, where's my retail savings? Yes. <laughs> and it places the the, 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 the ISPs in, in a difficult position which uh, I'm like, well, it's, it's, not, it's not unfair. It's not bad for us. No, but, yeah. no not at all. And uh, yeah, so um, just, some, just something inter- <laughs> interesting to ponder upon. Then something else interesting that we came upon um, is the fact that Telcom is planning to spin off or is at least looking at spinning off its copper network from the main business into a special purpose vehicle, a, a type of legal entity. So special purpose vehicles are typically... Uh, mm, just an entity. Yeah, yeah it's, it are typically used to, to ring fence and, and manage financial risk. Um, that, that's their typical use case. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that Telcom has been under pressure from at least three different places. Um, they recently reached a settlement between them and the Competition Commission to, uh, amongst other things, pay a 200 million rand fine and um, enact a functional separation of telecom, retail, and wholesale, which there was already supposed to be, by the way, but let's not get into that. Um, the, the, uh, that settlement still has to be verified by the competition tribunal, but uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have much information on that, but I wouldn't expect much around that to change. Uh, I would expect you know, people to be kind of happy with the settlement and and let it go forward. Otherwise, it's just going to drag out the process. Mm. Um, And uh, so there's that thing to think about. Then ICASA has said in so many words that they are just going to implement the uh, facilities leasing regulations or the regulations as they stand right now. And they're going to do that by March 2014 for local loop unbundling. 
And then there is um, one other place where they're taking pressure, the National Planning Commission, who said that there needs to be a structural separation at Telcom because it's this vertically integrated behemoth that is limiting competition in the space in inverted uh, in in uh, in between the lines. Um, so uh, it, it's quite interesting to see this happening. Um, th- from from what I can see, Telcom is is looking at leasing back the network. So it's not going to be a matter of everybody buying into this thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fact is, the groundwork is being laid for a separate entity altogether to manage the last mile. So provided the regulations are in place, provided there's enough pressure and will, I think we're looking at the start of local loop unbundling. I don't want to get too happy too soon, um, yeah. but it's looking good. And, um, and uh, hopefully um, this, this then also means um, further competition, better prices. So you know, even though the, the IPC rate cut might not be what, it, what we wanted it to be, this might be the start of something else. And, and that would be really cool. It just feels like we've been talking about this stuff for forever. So it's nice to see something is finally happening. I mean, possibly. Wow. Yeah. Oh, possibly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So some very pertinent questions being asked in IRC right now, which I cannot answer on air, unfortunately, <laughs> because it's something I'm looking into. Um, yes. So uh, once, once I've done the articles, I'll speak about it more freely. Um, but yes, uh, some very good questions in the IRC, uh, like w- what is being said about this uh, by industry? Are they going to step like if they, if you know, for example, let's say that uh, Telcom opened funding opportunities to the rest of industry and said, hey, who wants to buy into this network? Who would who would seize that opportunity? Everybody has been talking about to see a collective of people that come out and say, okay, we represent, you know. X, Y, and Z, let's do this thing. Yeah, exactly. Because everybody has said that they want LLU. Uh, yes. Neotel, Vodacom, Vox Telecom, um, you know, um, some smaller and bigger guys have said that the copper network is critical to South Africa. We need LLU. We need it now. We need competition, blah, blah, blah. Now there's this opportunity. Uh, well, now there's this thing happening uh, in the hypothetical scenario, which is probably not likely, but in the hypothetical scenario that funding is raised from the private sector, who would step up? And I don't want to say much more on that. I have some information mm. on that, but I can't say anything right now. Um, stick you around. like doing that to us. Yeah, uh. Stick around after the show when it's not recording, and I'll <laughs> tell you guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So then, Luke, you've had some fun and games with UEFI. Um, <laughs> now let's just get this right name right. It's UEFI. U-E-F-I. Yes, UEFI. All right. I've, I've entitled this next segment UEFI Fun Times with Luke. So this started out as a rant pre-show, and Became a show item, <laughs> but um, I. So far, my experience with with all things Windows 8.1 and specifically branded equipment like your Dells and your HP, it's it's not been fun times. Um, it it seems that that UEFI Secure Boot is more of a hindrance to you know if if you want to. I want to image this machine as quickly as I can and so to keep it as fresh as I can for as long as I can and you know the ability to do so just is balked you just can't <laughs> the tools don't support the new bootloaders or uh, you know it's fiddly it's picky um, so, so just just for clarity for somebody who maybe hasn't uh, seen our previous rants on UEFI um, <laughs> UEFI is a replacement for the existing way that we boot PCs. I would say it's a concurrent mechanism for the way we boot uh, computers so whereas we've had things like the, the master file uh, the master boot tables before now they've just replaced it with a system called EFI which I don't really remember the acronym for but uh, it's a Google format <laughs> Other people and, can look uh, that up. So what they do is that the the header is much bigger and it allows for disks that are you know like extensible firmware interface ridiculously large like byte sizes that you can't even think about that's how large they are and um, it's it's just it's a, it's a horror. <laughs> It's the best way I can and, describe and, and, it. And uh, we, we, um, we talked – when we last talked about this, we talked about how the Linux guys were unhappy about this because it means that they would effectively not be able to be I, installed to, on UEFI to, machines. To get Linux to work, I effectively have to turn the secure boot part of the UEFI sections off. Um, and then it will still moan at you that, that the, the disk that you're trying to boot is not um, signed 
or secure, and then it's a whinge fest. So you, you basically, you're, or you're always going to have this, this thing asking you how you want to boot your machine up. Um, of course, uh, people could see that there, that there were going to be problems with this. Uh, I mean, in terms of like Dell and them. So you can turn off the boot, the, the, um, you know, the UEFI bootloader entirely, but it seems kind of defeatist to do that, especially if, you know, you've been told, this is the new thing, go with it. Mm. Uh, and then to say, no, I can't make my stuff work, uh, how do I get my MBR discs back up mm. and running? Mm. That seems stupid. Yeah, uh, you, you actually had issues where you semi, well not, se- I wanted to say semi-bricked machines, but, but you basically rendered uh, machines inoperable. Well, we have some nice testers at work and they managed to brick or effectively make a Windows 8 machine useless within five minutes by somehow disabling the, the user rights at elevation system. Um, <laughs> so you can no longer you know, do any basic task that requires user access it, elevation. Is, is this separate from UEFI now? Uh, no, this is back now in, in Windows with the UAC, okay. normal UAC. Yeah. And this is what now led me down this, this, this road of trying to, how do I reinstall this thing? And It started with, you know, like, how do I access my recovery ROM? I don't see it in the list of, you know, bootable devices. Hmm. Dig a little bit more. Uh, Well, the Windows recovery partition says it's not there. But I know it has to be here because this is part of my install. And so it just went further and further and further. Down the rabbit hole. Down the rabbit (laughs) hole. And... uh, I think as it stands at the moment, those, those, those machines are now running just plain old MBR um, <laughs> just so that I could use them again. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, anyway, so... You it's w- a learning curve is what I have to say to that. As if you're forced to just get as much information as you can as soon as you can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's horrifying. Yeah, so that you can do this as quickly as and possible. And the other thing that I have to say to that as well is that the ghosting tools or the imaging tools, they're not quite there yet when it comes to um, EFI disks or secure EFI disks. And these are the proprietary ones in, in addition Correct. to the free the ones. So free like UDP ones, cost is what I used to use. Um, the only one that I saw that could actually do anything was Clonezilla, amazingly. Um, oh, but hold on. Clones are lessons only. <laughs> sure, but uh, we're, we're of a camp that we, we traditionally used Akronis. And so the difference is amazing. It's like, oh, this thing actually is supported. And you don't have to struggle your brains out. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, oh, interesting. All right, we never end our show on a rant anymore. Well, we try. <laughs> <laughs> so, Johan, you've got us a cool little kicker. It's, uh, it's, shall I, can I just give the title? The Roomba Game. What is this? I have no idea. I put this uh, in, yeah? I actually linked it in. Oh, there we go. Luke. Um, Blame Luke. Yeah, excellent. Blame Luke. Yeah. So it's as exciting as that picture <laughs> describes it. So, so basically, you? it's a game where you get to control a Roomba and you just drive around cleaning up uh, the mess. Does this house. control an actual Roomba somewhere in the world? No, oh. unfortunately not. It, it, it's real time. It's real speed. So you get to cruise Are around and however me? slowly that flicking thing goes i want them to introduce a cat dlc i want a cat to be able to jump on what me makes it then. interesting as hell is that they played like tinkly little jazz music while you while you drive your roomba around and they also have a multiplayer mode where you can go head to head with another roomba in the room <laughs> <laughs> now surprisingly this is a sequel game to a game that they made before, which was a top-down Roomba game. <laughs> top-down 2D Roomba game. I mean, was it a strategy game? Did you no, have to no, collect it's, resources? It's, it's still the same kind of crap. You just drive your Roomba around the room. Um, I, I do not understand <laughs> why. <laughs> yeah, this is wonderful. The worst of all is it's, down, it's a downloadable game. It's not even in the browser. This is great. So You've got to download and install th- this. This is fantastic. Uh, this is so the first thing I'm doing when I get home. Around this is awesome. Thanks, Luke. But multiplayer. <laughs> multiplayer? <laughs> Why? It's, <laughs> it's like what we've been asking for for all this time. I want Deathmatch Minesweeper. <laughs> Give I me think, Deathmatch I Minesweeper. I think you're going to be disappointed at how fast you can ram. I mean, ramming <laughs> speed is like, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> uh, good job. With that, thank you so much for joining me in the show. Luke Potgieter, where can people find you? Um, you can harass me on Twitter. Uh, that's where I am often uh, at FRK. Yeah, um, but don't try anywhere else. I don't look at that at all. <laughs> all right, cool. <laughs> and and uh, you can be found in IRC Weekly almost. Yes, uh, well, under the moniker Fried Roadkill. 
uh, when you guys are showing a show, yes. <laughs> We're back. We're back in full swing. <laughs> Johan Else, where can people find you? Well, mostly at the office at the moment, but if I am at home, you can find me at uh, uh, www.who-else.co.za. Great stuff. I'm Jan Vermeulen. You can find me most of the time at my broadband at ZRA. I'm also on the Twitter at Jan VZA, J A N V Z A, don't ask. And also on Google Plus, Jan Vermeulen, and then you circle me, doomp, and write me mean messages. And don't you have to drag and drop? Yes, that's I, circling. Oh, yeah, that's, is that now become Google, a, a noun? Google tried to verb it from the beginning. <laughs> circle. Circle your contacts. There we go. Uh, the mixer is Annie Vermeulen. You can find her uh, here, uh, as she likes to say always, or on Twitter, at AnnieBugZA. Great stuff. With that, thank you so much for joining us. Check out the rest of the shows. Like us on Facebook, LT Star Network. Follow us on Twitter, all that stuff. And check out the other shows in, a Let's, in the Let's Talk Network stable. We've got Let's Talk Hack uh, once a month, and we've got Let's Talk Possibility on Mondays. Check those guys out. They're good, they do good, good work. See you next time. <laughs>